Welcome to the Bible Questions podcast brought to you by BibleQuestions.org and the Holly Street Church of Christ. This podcast is dedicated to answering your Bible questions from the Bible. My name is Jeff, and along with Brian, we are the hosts of this program. Welcome to the Bible Questions podcast. Along with you, as usual, is Brian and Jeff. Jeff, how's it going today? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Appreciate uh, this opportunity to bring some more truths from uh, God's Word out to the uh, international uh, internet audience. Yeah, it certainly is a privilege to be able to talk about different aspects of God's Word. And, you know, Jeff, one of the most commonly misunderstood areas of truth in the Bible is regarding the two different covenants that God made with mankind. And, you know, there's such a misunderstanding in the religious world today that, you know, it, it really leads many religions to believe and practice elements, for instance, of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament in our Bibles, uh, along with, or in some cases, you know, in place of uh, the law of Christ, you know, the New Covenant, which mankind is following and expected to follow today. And so, you know, in this episode, we want to really kind of examine the purpose of the first covenant and how God had planned all along to replace that first covenant with the second covenant. And what we also want to do is we want to look at the parts of the old covenant that many religions follow today in error and it kind of examine, you know, some of the consequences of doing so. I guess ultimately we also want to seek to understand the key elements of the new covenant that we live by today. And we're just going to do that at a very high level. And then we will encourage, you know, our listeners to dig a little bit deeper as to what some of those key elements of the new covenant are, because ultimately, Jeff, that's what we're going to be judged by, right? The law of Christ. And it's important to understand it. Yep. Very good. So I think probably what we should do is lay a little bit of groundwork. Because when we talk about the Old Testament, or more especially the Old Covenant, to kind of give people a, a sense of where we're coming from with, with that terminology. You know, certainly we see God establishing or making certain promises, if you will, uh, or a covenant, if you will, with uh, Abraham, his son Isaac, his grandson uh, Jacob, uh, whose name was later changed to Israel. And that, you know, through uh, Abraham, you know, God made, you know, certain you know, promises, predictions, etc. Starting off with Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, you know, God speaking to, I think at that point, his name was Abram, before he was renamed as Abraham. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. You, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse the, him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's, that's important to keep in mind. Going forward, uh, where God kind of repeats and, and expands, Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Now, from that, we see specifically the his son Isaac, uh, verse 19, uh, Genesis 26, verse 24, um, and as I said, grandson Jacob, uh, Genesis chapter 46, verses 3 and 4, and we see the physical uh, circumcision you know, being a sign of that covenant, uh, and we see even Moses later, Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, verses 11 through 12. In fact, Brian, do you want to go ahead and read that? Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 11 and 12. Oh, yes. Here it says, Therefore you shall keep the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which I command you today, to observe them. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy with uh, which he swore to your fathers. Okay. So again, we see this starting with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his descendants, which became known as the nation of Israel. But you may notice it was somewhat uh, conditional, you know, if they keep and do the commandments as part of the covenant. Going forward to the time of Jeremiah, you know, many, many hundreds of years later, we see there's a new covenant, a promise of a new uh, relationship, covenant, etc. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning with verse 30, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. But they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So a different covenant, not, an, not something in addition, not a tweak, but something different, unlike the covenant made previously. Now, fast forward into the first century AD, we have the Holy Spirit through Paul writing to the Galatians, and he takes up this theme, if you will, on what the purpose of the old covenant law was and how it was a quote-unquote schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ, the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Starting in Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed, which is why I emphasized that quote uh, earlier. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Hmm. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, curses everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Of course, he's referring to the old covenant. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Again, pointing out that under the old covenant, that you had to basically obey each law, and each law you didn't resulted in sin. And that temporarily that sin could be somewhat, I don't know what the right word is, overlooked uh, via animal sacrifices, which we can read elsewhere, were, were really ultimately not sufficient. Or forgiveness. Continuing on in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Curses everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles and Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Skip down to verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? The law, law of Moses. It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Of course, the seed being Christ. Verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. There was our tutor, or translations, other translations have schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Continuing on verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it all kind of ties together. The covenant made with Abraham initially for his physical descendants as shown through the covenant via circumcision, now is available to everyone, you know, Jew and Gentile, via faith in Christ Jesus. Now, the reasons for this change, this concept of quote-unquote fault uh, from the old law, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, uh, beginning with verse 1. Now, this is the main point of the things we're saying. We have such a high priest, of course, that's referring to Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Skip down to verse 6. 
But now he, and that's Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry in so much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant. There we go. Which is established on better promises. Uh, verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Well, that's a quote from Jeremiah 31 that we uh, referenced a few moments ago. And finally, Brian, uh, given the fact that this old law, this old covenant was fulfilled, it was quote unquote symbolically nailed to Christ's cross. And that's the point that the Holy Spirit through Paul makes in Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. Uh, you want to go ahead and read verse 11 through verse 17? Uh, sure. Here it says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having, for, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things, a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. All right. And in fact, a good portion of uh, Paul's letter to both uh, the Christians in Colossae as well as in Galatia are dealing with this concept of old covenant, new covenant, because there were you know, a lot of Jews converted to Christianity. Uh, many of them Pharisees, zealous for the law, wanted to bind various practices of the Old Covenant to include circumcision. And in this passage that Brian just got through reading, Paul says, well, that's not the case. I mean, Old Covenant, physical circumcision, etc., has been done away with. Now, symbolically, there is a circumcision, and that's through uh, baptism, uh, immersion in water. And that given that, you know, change, if you will, the old has been replaced by the new. So therefore, we should not, you know, let anyone judge or condemn us in any sort of, you know, Old Testament food restrictions, uh, Old Covenant uh, festivals, uh, Old Covenant celebrations around the new moon, the Sabbath day, uh, etc., which were a shadow, if you will, of things to come. And now that those things have come, you know, through Christ, the new covenant, he's now our high priest, etc. The old has been done away with. The old covenant, the old old law has been done away with. Brian, any, any thoughts before uh, uh, I toss it to you for the next section? Yeah, you know, some might wonder, um, look, if we're, we're no longer under the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, uh, then why is it even in our Bibles, right, if we're no longer under that covenant? You know, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 talks about how, you know, whatever things were written before, you know, referencing the Old Covenant— were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So, you know, it's important to study the Old Testament because through it we learn about the creation, the promise you mentioned that was made to Abraham, you know, the details of the first covenant that God made with the Israelites, uh, how they did not faithfully keep that covenant, and why God had a plan for a new covenant. And then ultimately, going back to that promise he referenced early on that was made to Abraham, how it was God's intention all along through Christ to bless all the nations of the earth through that new covenant. So certainly a lot of value, right, Jeff, and being able to still have that in our Bibles to give us more understanding overall of God's scheme of redemption. Uh, exactly. And in many ways, if all you read was the New Testament, you know, you'd come on the scene, so to speak, in the middle of the movie <laughs> right. and not really understand really more fully, you know, who the players are and why they're doing what they're doing and quotations from somewhere that you've never heard about before. So, yes, indeed, you know, having having a good understanding and reading and studying of you know, the Old Covenant uh, in particular or the Old Testament in general certainly can give us a, a very solid foundation to better understand the new. Yes, completely agree.
So now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about, you know, parts of the old law that are still practiced by religions today. And as you look at the different religions in the world around you, and, you know, maybe for those who are listening, you belong to a religion, you might, you know, realize that, you know, they're following parts of that old law, that old covenant. Should they be doing that? Well, one of the most common areas that you see in the religious world today is the observation of the Ten Commandments. And not only is it still practiced or believed by some today, you even, you know, have, for instance, here in the United States, courthouses, for instance, that still have the Ten Commandments posted. Uh, it's it's amazing how there's this lack of understanding that, you know, the Ten Commandments were part of the old law, and we no longer follow that law. So when Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled the old law, and through his blood brought about the new law or the new covenant, you know, we call the law of Christ or New Testament that we live by today. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, what Jesus was talking about is that he fulfilled the old law when he died on the cross. He basically completed or fulfilled that old law and through his blood and through his death and his resurrection brought about the law of Christ. And so in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, speaking of Jesus, it says, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. So, you know, Jesus fulfilled the promise that God made in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, that Jeff read a little while ago, to give mankind a new covenant. And so when he shed his precious blood and died on the cross, once again, that brought about the new covenant, or what we might say ratified that new covenant that God made with mankind. So once the law of Christ uh, replaced the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments and everything that was part of the old law was no longer in effect. So therefore, we are technically not following any of the Ten Commandments under the old law today. And one of those commandments, for instance, was worshiping on the Sabbath, which we'll talk more about in a minute. But, uh, you know, Jeff, what might be confusing to some is that, you know, the principles behind nine of the Ten Commandments can be found under the law of Christ. And so what that simply means is that these principles or commandments were also instituted under the law of Christ and therefore apply to us today. Uh, the key, though, is that these laws, these new laws, in essence, right, or restated laws, whatever you want to call them, are not the Ten Commandments under the old law, but the laws under the New Testament, if that makes sense. Jeff, any thoughts along that line before we move on? Yeah, the only thing I just might add, and, and sometimes I'll make this analogy, like with students in my Bible class, you know, here within the United States, you know, early on, you know, there were you know, laws that the various Indian tribes, Native Americans had. And then in certain parts of the country, the Spanish came in and there were laws under the Spanish. And then later on, like here in Colorado, there was the territory of Colorado and there were certain laws under the territory uh, uh, concept. And then later on, we became a state. And so there's laws associated with the state. And, and in most of those cases, you'd probably find that, for instance, you know, stealing horses or murdering people was wrong. And so, you know, a general principle that you kind of see repeated. So in terms of today, uh, you know, when someone, you know, murders someone else, we don't try them under the laws of the Native Americans or the Spaniards or the territorial law. We try them under, you know, rules regarding murder under state law. You know, very similar in different laws, but technically under the most current set of laws. And I use that kind of as an analogy, if you will, to kind of illustrate the fact that, well, murder was wrong in you know early Genesis before the Ten Commandments. Murder was wrong as part of the Ten Commandments. Murder is still wrong under the law of Christ. And so we're following the law of Christ and you know do no murder, et cetera. Uh, and not technically the Ten Commandments, and not technically, you know, early Genesis, even though there's very similar. I don't know if that helps or confuses things, but I thought I'd throw that in. Well, no, I really like it. I think it absolutely helps to explain the difference there, right, and the similarities, right? So, yeah, very good. And, you know, when we think about the Ten Commandments, we, we know that under the old law, the Israelites were commanded to 
worship on the Sabbath and rest on the Sabbath and so forth. In fact, if you look in the religious world today, the Seventh-day Adventists still advocate and still practice worshiping on the Sabbath. And what we see, though, is that under the law of Christ, the day of worship changed. So, you know, Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's Supper, and that was to remember his death, which brought about the new covenant. And in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we are told that disciples, you know, Christians, met on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And we most everyone recognizes that, right? Sunday to remember his death. So it says that they came together to break bread. And so when you study the Lord's Supper or the communion that Jesus established before he died, you see that it was made up of eating unleavened bread every first day of the week to remember his death. And so that bread is emblematic of his body and that we also partake of what's called the fruit of the vine in the New Testament. It's, it's really, you know, unfermented grape juice. And that's to, is emblematic of his blood. And so we see that Christians came together in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, to recognize or to, uh, once again, partake of that remembrance. Now, we also see in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, that Christians came together. It says, in, I'm quoting here, first day of the week, right? Paul said, to lay by and store as you have been prospered. So, you know, Christians came together, and it makes sense, right, that they would do it on the same day that they were already coming together to remember the Lord's death, to also give into the local church treasury so that the work of the Lord could be done. So we see clearly, and these are just two examples of where, once again, the day of worship changed, and now we meet on the first day of the week, Sunday, instead of Saturday, which was, once again, the Sabbath day under the old law. Another area where we see, you know, some churches, and certainly the Catholic Church, is the use of physical priests today. So the Catholic Church is a good example of where they have physical priests. And, you know, under the New Covenant, we are clearly taught in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 3. In fact, you'll see throughout the book of Hebrews, it makes very clear on several occasions that Christ is now our high priest. And also, the scriptures teach us that Christians are a holy priesthood. And we see that in verse Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. So instead of having, like we did under the old law, where you had a high priest and you had individual priests who would approach God on behalf of the people under the law of Christ, because all Christians are now priests, we, through Christ Jesus, now can each and individually approach God through prayer. So that's a pretty big change, and it's actually an important change because it allows us to pray directly to God. We're under the old law. Uh, that uh, you know, approaching of God could only be done by a physical priest. Another area moving on is tithing. So you know, you'll hear people sometimes talk about, like when I was mentioning 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, how you know, on the first day of the week, Christians give. Sometimes people say, well, we're going to tithe. Actually, tithing was done under the old law. We, we do not tithe today as that was part of the old law that you read about in the Old Testament. But under the law of Christ, we are now commanded to give as we have been prospered, as we just mentioned. So we do still give today, but it's not tithing. In fact, if you go and study tithing under the Old Testament, you'll see that it was more than just come giving some physical money. They gave of their crops, they gave of their animals for sacrifice and those kinds of things. Whereas today we are literally giving of, as we have prospered in the sense that we, we give, you know, physical money, if you will, on the first day of the week so the Lord's work can be done. One final area I'll mention, and this isn't certainly all of them, but these are just some examples, once again, of where if you look out in the religious world today, you see parts of the old law that are still practiced. And another common area is in, in the use of instrumental music in worship. So, you know, under the old covenant, you do see instruments being used in worship. But under the new covenant, the Bible makes it clear that we are to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. In fact, if you look through the entire New Testament, you're not going to see 
musical instruments being used in worship. Well, why is that? Well, because we have passages like Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 and Ephesians 5 and verse 19, where it once again says that we sing and make melody in our hearts. And so, Jeff, you know, to me, this kind of makes sense, because if you think about it, the old law was physical. There were a lot of physical things done, like sacrificing and the playing of physical musical instruments, whereas the New Testament and the New Covenant You know, it's spiritual in nature, right? We're offering the spiritual sacrifices, such as the fruit of our lips. And so to me, it just makes logical sense to say, well, now we make melody in our hearts to the Lord instead of on physical instruments. Yeah, good points. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, I think when you started this section about you're not aware of people who bind or practice all the old law. Of course, you know, Messianic Jews would, that would take old law and bring Christ under that canopy, of course. But, you know, for the vast majority of people, you know, they may like the instruments of music, as you mentioned, or they might you know, want to do the tithing or worshiping on the Sabbath. But they don't do all of it. It's like they cherry pick pieces. For instance, they may want to bind the Sabbath, but they don't want to bind the death penalty for violating the Sabbath and picking up sticks and working on the Sabbath. Or they don't want to bind the death penalty for all of the other violations of laws under the law of Moses. Certainly they don't offer animal sacrifices. They don't have annual pilgrimages to Jerusalem. You know, simple things like blending of materials uh, in our garments or you know, any number of other things they ignore. Which has always made me wonder, you know, from a consistency perspective, why they would, you know, go back and reach in and grab some things, but ignore the rest. Yeah, and I wonder, too, like, whether it's the Messianic Jews or any others, I don't know of any that practice everything, right? And I think that's what you're saying, right? So, like, does is there any I, religious groups today that literally offer sac- animal sacrifices? I don't know of any. Now, there might Not that I know of. And, in, in fact, if you kind of look at the Old Covenant... There were a lot of things that were required in terms of worshiping uh, in or around initially the tabernacle and then later the temple and all the you know daily, monthly, annual sacrifices at the temple required, as you indicated, a physical priesthood descendants specifically from Aaron and, and many of other things that, you know, not even you know, uh, ultra-conservative Jews today. Not even they practice. So, there you go. Interesting, yeah, yep. So, Brian, I think that kind of takes us to our next section of, you know, people might say, well, you know, it's it's all the Bible. It all came from God. You know, certainly we would want to honor God by following the laws of Christ. But, you know, you know, surely God would not be offended if we were to also, you know, add to, you know, the law of Christ, you know, some of these other things out of the law of, you know, Moses, like, you know, uh, unclean foods, etc. Uh, you know, are, are there certain, you know, is that wrong? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, there's a number of consequences we'll get into in this next section, trying to follow or bind certain sections of the Old Covenant. For starters, you know, this is nothing new. You know, if we talk about, you know, Seventh-day Adventists, you know, this is not new. Even in the first century, uh, Jews, especially Pharisees who converted to Christianity, wanted to, you know, continue practicing the law as Jews, but they also wanted to bind that law on the Gentiles that were now starting to come, you know, um, and hear about the gospel and be baptized and be converted to Christianity, etc., a big uh, controversy that we can read in several places, Colossians, Galatians, um, and even in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Acts chapter 15, starts off. Uh, Certain men came down from Judea, taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Uh, Verse 5, but some of the sect of the Pharisees believed, rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them, again referring to the Gentiles, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, if you continue down in that passage, uh, Acts 15, verses, uh, starting with verse 23, what was the conclusion? Well, as James, through the Holy Spirit, kind of summarizes, uh, 
Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality, or some translations have fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So very clearly, we are not to blend the old and the new, and we're not to add the old not to add the new to the old, if I said that right, but there, we are to observe a clear distinction between the two. In fact, going back to the passage we uh, mentioned earlier, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, so that no one judge you or condemn you, food, drink, festival, new moon, Sabbath, etc. Uh, verse 20, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why? As though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So now we see it tied this kind of binding the old law on us today as being self-imposed, uh, religion, uh, not of any value, etc. Uh, Brian, we certainly see the, the points you were making, you know, consequences of bringing forward various Old Testament religious observances now turns our worship into a false sense of worship, doing things we shouldn't be doing because we have no authority. I mean, burning incense, which you didn't mention, but but I would mention, you know, using Old Testament terms like altars, sanctuaries. Again, that's Old Testament terminology. Uh, you mentioned musical instruments. I could add in choirs and soloists. Yep, you can find them under the Old Covenant. You sure cannot find them under the New. Uh, the other thing that we you know might mention is if you really want to start binding some of the Old Covenant, you have to bind it all. That's what the Holy Spirit through Paul says to the Galatians, chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. In fact, Brian, do you want to read that verse, uh, let's say 1 through, well, how about 1 through 6 of Galatians 5? Okay, uh, here it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Yeah, and that particular uh, phraseology in, in verse 3, Brian, debtor to keep the whole law. If you want to be justified by keeping the law of Moses, you're supposed to keep the whole law. And oh, by the way, you're supposed to keep it sinlessly, which you can't, no one can, because you know if you violate the law, well, okay, I'm supposed to offer animal sacrifices. Wait a minute, animal sacrifices really were insufficient. Well, okay, so then why am I seeking to be justified by sinless observance of the Old Testament law? Now, certainly, under the law of Christ, even with God's grace and Christ's sacrifice, we are to be obedient, and even when we do sin, we are to repent, because that's part of the provisions God has made through his grace to allow us to tap into Jesus and his blood and having the forgiveness of our sins. But if you want to go back to the old law, which carries with it that burden, I think the yoke, heavy yoke, I think uh, we mentioned in uh, verse one, uh, yoke of bondage. Paul says, no, no, you don't do that. In fact, as we uh, have said, and Brian, you kind of did in a second part, some people start to bind things from the Old Testament that they really have no right to bind. I mean, circumcision, we mentioned, you know, Acts chapter 15, 
uh, certainly a big deal today. Uh, people want to bind clean and unclean food distinctions. Seventh-day Adventists uh, certainly are, are uh, very much into that. You know, forbidding the eating of pork products, you know, as an example. Uh, but there's an interesting occurrence in uh, the book of Acts. And I think, unless I'm mistaken, it's Acts chapter 10, where Peter's on the top of his house waiting for lunch. You know, it's about the middle of the day. He's very hungry. And while he was waiting for lunch, he had a vision, uh, starting with verse 11. Uh, he saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and kind of let down to the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. It's like, you're hungry. Okay, here's some, you know, in a vision, here's some food. And Peter said, oh, not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything common or unclean, verse 15. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up to heaven again. Now, that particular context, Acts 10, Acts 11, refers to God having cleansed the Gentiles, and the gospel now is available to the Gentiles by faith in Jesus, and that Peter shouldn't call the Gentiles common or unclean. But there's still the physical aspect of this passage, where God has, you know, cleansed these animals, and the food distinctions under the law of Moses are no longer applicable. And we should not, you know, bind, yes, you can eat this food. No, you can't eat that food. Now, can people still do that for, for you know, dietary reasons or health reasons or, you know, some foods may be healthier than other foods? Oh, sure. And some people may want to be vegetarian, okay, for, for health reasons. That's fine. But to do it religiously for religious reasons and say it's sinful for you to have, you know, bacon, ham, you know, et, et cetera, can't, can't go that far. Uh, and then, of course, again, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, you've become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you are fallen from grace, fallen from the system of grace that God has set up through the new covenant when you try to bind aspects of the old covenant. Brian, anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very important point is that when you do keep those elements of the old law, you estrange yourself, right? Separate yourself from Christ because now you're in essence disregarding the fact that the covenant changed. And it's really disrespectful if you think about it, not just to Christ, but of course to God. All right, so now uh, let's talk a little bit about key elements of the new covenant. So the covenant that we live under today, so if you were to open your Bibles, the New Testament, right, in our Bibles, that's the covenant, the law of Christ that we live under today. So uh, a couple of things we'll touch on, and once again, this isn't all inclusive, so just would encourage you uh, to take what we say and not only look, of course, to verify it's true, but more importantly, to, to learn as much as you can about the new covenant, because that's what you're going to be judged by. All of us will be judged by. So anyhow, one of the, the key elements that we see under the new covenant is that Jesus was the one sin offering for all time. So under the old covenant, there was the sacrificing of animals. There was a lot of animal sacrificing that took place for a variety of reasons, as a sin offering, as a peace offering, so on and so forth. Well, in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, it says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So it's no longer necessary that to have a physical priest that offers animal sacrifices once a year on behalf of the people. Why is that? Because Jesus died once for all, and he became that perfect sacrifice. And so God, under this covenant, no longer requires those annual sacrifices. Another key element that we see is that Christ has been given all authority. And so you know, one of the things that God promised is that there, all authority would now be through this promised Messiah, which was Christ. And so Hebrews chapter 1, 
beginning in verse 1, says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Notice here it says, whom he has appointed, heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So that's where Jesus is today. He is at the right hand of God. And Jesus himself said and confirmed that all authority has been given to him. Jeff, you want to read that, uh, or Jesus talks about that over in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20? Sure. And this was one of the last things that he, you know, he was talking to his disciples about before he ascended. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And so we see in this passage that Jesus not only confirmed that all authority has been given to him, but he immediately gives them a command, right? Having authority, he tells them, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then once again, commands them to observe all the things that Jesus had taught them. So we can see he has this authority, he's giving them a command. You know, if you were to look back, this was prophesied under the Old Covenant, that God would raise up a prophet to do this. So in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 18, God said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So I would encourage our listeners to take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 through 20. And then as we just read, you know, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 3, make it clear that while God did under the old covenant, speak to the fathers, what we might call the, the you know, the, the patriarchs, if you will, uh, and also by the prophets. Well, today he now speaks to us through his son. And in fact, if you would study that even further, we know that Jesus also, when he ascended back to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to fully reveal all of God's commands and all of God's truth, which is what we see in our New Testament today. Uh, another area where, another key element, I should say, of the New Covenant is, you know, there is now Christ, as we touched on a little earlier, who's the eternal high priest uh, versus the old Levitical priesthood that was required under the old law. And so we're told that Jesus is the final and eternal priest that has been appointed. So there's no longer a change of priest, as we saw under the old law. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12, and I like actually the NIV rendering here where it says, For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. So, you know, under the old law, priests had to come through the tribe of Levi. And under this law, there is a similarity to Melchizedek, we're told in Hebrews. And, and so Jesus did not come from the same tribe that we see under the old law, Instead, he came through the tribe of Judah, and because there was a change of the priesthood, that necessitated or required there also be a change of the law, which there was, right? That's the new covenant that we live under today. So as we were touching on earlier, you know, to be consistent, those who still follow the old law should still be seeking to appoint priests according to the rules or the guidelines or the commandments of the old law. And so just like with circumcision, Somebody can't keep just part of the old law. And as we read earlier in Galatians 5, you know, Paul said, I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So once again, cannot pick and choose or just keep aspects under the old law. But more importantly, we want to understand that Christ is the eternal high priest. I touched on earlier and just want to elaborate real quick. The, on the fact that, you know, all Christians are now spiritual priests. So we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, Peter, uh, the Holy Spirit through Peter says, but you are a chosen generation, talking about Christians, 
You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So Peter here is making it clear that all of us are now priests under this law. So a couple of others that we want to take a look at. One is that the gospel is for all. And Peter himself said, you know, when you were referring to Jeff in Acts chapter 10, teaching from God that, you know, all, all food is, and all animals can now be eaten. Uh, Peter also came to the conclusion, uh, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And so the gospel is for all. Unlike under the old covenant, God made the covenant just with the Israelites, his own special people. And even though you could have proselytes that could, you know, if they adhered to that same law would be acceptable to God, it was really a covenant that was only made uh, with the Israelites. A couple other things, and I'll just give you some passages to look at on your own as our listeners, but that under the law of Christ, we are now, our hearts are now circumcised instead of our physical flesh. So in Romans chapter 2, Paul says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So now we are spiritually circumcised. Our heart is spiritually circumcised. And Jeff, you'd referred to this Jerusalem conference earlier in Acts chapter 15. And as you touched on, You know, they, through the Holy Spirit, came to understand because the Jews were trying to tell everybody that they still had to be physically circumcised under the law of Christ, that that was not true. And so that was clarified in that Jerusalem conference. A couple other sins are forgiven and remembered no more. And so if you think about the fact that there was a remembrance of sin once a year under the old law, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12 tells us under the law of Christ, uh, where it's said here, By God, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Uh, One other thing that we touched on is the day of worship uh, has changed. As we pointed out earlier, it's now on Sunday, the first day of the week, when we come together to remember the Lord's death. And then we do things like sing songs and hear preaching of the word. And then as we are also commanded in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, we contribute. We give into the local treasury. And then the final thing is that, and once again, not all inclusive, but just several elements of the the law of Christ is that we are taught God will provide a final judgment. So one thing we saw, Jeff, under the old law was oftentimes God would bring swift judgment, whether it was against people or against nations, where they were literally put to death. But under the law of Christ, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30, the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. So that's one other big difference is under the law of Christ, this judgment will now come on the judgment day. And as we read in passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10, on that judgment day is when God will render his final judgment and we will either be rewarded with eternal life or punished with eternal punishment. So Jeff, turn it over to you now for any thoughts before we get into our questions. Yeah, and I think that last point you made is a very valid one because the old covenant embedded within it or an essential part of it was that was their not only religious law, but that was their civil law, meaning, you know, the nation of Israel was what is commonly called a theocracy, meaning these religious laws encoded in their civil laws. So you have the people, the village, the state, if you will, you know, executing capital punishment on people who fail to comply with religious edicts. Well, that's not part of the law of Christ. Yes, we look to civil government for, you know, people that are egregiously, you know, violating laws and killing people, etc., uh, executing capital punishment. But it's not up to Christians, it's not up to the local church to execute people, you know, for violation of law. So, again, it's a lot of changes that, that people need to keep in mind. Absolutely do. Well, let's go ahead and shift to our last uh, segment where we want to look at a couple of questions that were submitted along this line. And so the first one for you, Jeff, comes from Norm. 
uh, who said that he's a Mennonite by his own admission, and, and he asked, how important are Old Testament laws? Explain Leviticus 25, verse 4, and Exodus 23, 11. As a farmer, these are important to me. Okay. So if you go back to those two passages, basically they're referring to giving the land a rest, sometimes called a Sabbath rest, every seven years. So you can plant crops for six, but you need to let the land lie, what we might say, fallow or un. Uh, used for a year to give it a chance to rest. Now, while we have said that the Old Testament is no longer binding on us, it still contains some things that are, you know, some good wisdom, general principles, etc. You know, um, being a good steward, taking care of the land, taking care of domesticated animals, uh, you know, God's wisdom given to Solomon that's expressed in uh, Proverbs. And certainly today we see the, the the value or even the underlying scientific basis of why they did those kinds of things. Like even today with modern agriculture, you know, you give the soil a chance to rejuvenate, et cetera. And, and we don't do that for religious purposes. We do it for more, uh, if I can say, scientific purposes, if that makes sense. Likewise, referring back to the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, you know, there's positive examples of faithfulness, Hebrews chapter 11. There's negative examples of apostasy, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Sources of encouragement and comfort like Psalms 23, faith-building prophecies about the Messiah, Isaiah 53, etc. So there's a lot of good we can get from the Old Testament, so long as we realize it is not religiously uh, binding. Yeah, I appreciate those points, and especially the point you made about how the Old Testament, you know, still contains a lot of wisdom and general principles. I was thinking about, as you were saying that, you know, when it comes to disciplining your children, offering some kind of discipline, you know, the the Bible or or the Old Testament specifically talks about the value of, you know, if you do that, your child is more likely, for instance, to follow God when they get older. So yeah, lots of great general principles there. Psalms, Proverbs throughout that that really uh, can apply today. Yep, good points. Okay, Brian, your turn. So Roger wrote in saying, God gave Adam one commandment, uh, do not eat of the tree of knowledge. Uh, Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 13 through 17, talks about sin was not imputed when there is no law. And so Roger goes on to say, I've searched and there does not seem to be an answer to what happens to those who lived from Adam to Moses when the Mosaic law was given, which brought the full force of sin into being. Adam did not experience a physical death when he ate the fruit, but a spiritual one. I've searched Strong's uh, Concordance, and it does not differentiate between the two. Can you give me some insight onto this? And I think probably key being, uh, you know, under what law were people under prior to the law of Moses? Absolutely. It is a good question. It's one that, you know, as you study it, it's like, well, well, this law of Moses wasn't given, you know, all the way back at the very beginning. So yeah, fair question. And, you know, we know from the scriptures that God always held man accountable for sin. So if you think about prior to the law of Moses, we can conclude that God told man what he expected of him based on the fact that he punished those who failed to do what was expected. So for instance, you know, if you look at the life of Cain, We're told in Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, that the sacrifice he offered to God was not respected. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11 sheds a little bit more light on that when it tells us that he it's because he did not offer the sacrifice by faith as God expected. So, you know, we're told in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, you know, we can reasonably conclude that God told him what he expected. Now, if we go back to Genesis uh, chapter 4 and verse 5, we are told that Cain was very upset when God did not accept his sacrifice. And God said to him in verses 6 and 7, Why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So, Jeff, in those two little verses there, there's there's a lot that we can conclude, right? One is, God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? So, that tells us that he had to define what well was, right? What righteous is, if you will. And then also, you know, if you disregard God's commands, sin lies at the door, right? So, 
You know, it, 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 it we can become bitter like Cain and, and I want to do it my way sort of attitude. I mean, that applies. That's sort of a universal truth, if you will, for mankind. So notice here that in those passages that we just read, that God mentioned if Cain did well, he obeyed, he would be accepted by God. But if he did not, sin lies at the door. So once again, from this statement, we can reasonably conclude that God made it known what was expected of Cain and that it was possible for him to sin if he did not obey God. And so, uh, in fact, if you look in verse 8, the very next verse, well, Cain didn't. He didn't heed God's advice. And just as God said, you know, sin lied at the door. And ultimately, Cain, because of his own selfishness and his own anger and jealousy, rose up and killed his brother. And in verses 11 and 12 of, of Genesis 4, we see that God punished him for that sin. So, once the law of Moses was given, mankind was held accountable to every part of that law. And prior to that law, they were held accountable to what God revealed to them, or else we couldn't say that they would have sinned, right? If God wouldn't be fair for God to judge them or punish them if he didn't tell them what to do. So we have to reasonably conclude that he did that, uh, because as we saw earlier in 1 John 3, verse 4, sin is a transgression of the law. And we also see that. Uh, discussed in Romans chapter 4 and verse 15. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you for any thoughts you have on that. So if I go back to the analogy I gave earlier about, you know, Native American law, Spanish law, territorial law, you know, law of the United States. Similarly, you know, God has always had laws. Now, they have changed from time to time, but he has always had laws, expectations for us, for his creation. Uh, that he expects, you know, has you know, he doesn't leave us in the blind. I mean, he has communicated in different times in sundry ways. I think uh, Hebrews chapter one uh, refers to that. Uh, just and just what we have to keep in mind as part of our topic for today, that different laws, different people, different times. Don't try to mix them. Try to understand what the latest set is, so to speak for us to obey today. Brian, any other thoughts before I uh, point people to our website? Uh, just one final thought, and that is just to kind of go back to what we said at the beginning, that we wanted to uh, have this podcast because, you know, unfortunately there are so many religions today that believe or practice some elements of the Old Covenant. And unfortunately there are many people that do not really understand that there was a change of covenants and that we live under the law of Christ and will be judged by that law today. So just would encourage our listeners to learn as much about the covenant that God will hold us accountable to and do your very best to be faithful to what he has asked us to do. Good points. And so like we always prefer to do with our listeners, please come to our website, biblequestions.org. If you look under the topics menu item, lots of articles and uh, previously answered questions similar to the ones we've talked about today. Uh, for starters, look under C for Covenants for an article that uh, its title is The Old and New Covenants, so very relevant to our topic today. For Law of Moses and Law of Christ. M for Meat Eating, uh, which includes you know unclean foods, etc. And finally, S for Sabbath. Uh, so once again, as always, we like to say, you know, we would encourage you to come to the website, look at the material, but more importantly, look at the scriptures, read the scriptures, study them, compare them with what we have talked about and taught today, and more importantly, compare them with your current religious practice. And honestly, if you need to make a change, have the courage to make a change to be acceptable to God. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Bible Questions podcast. We invite you to visit our website. BibleQuestions.org, where you can submit a Bible question to be answered. And you can also search archives where we have answered several hundred Bible questions over the years. Our website also has a host of free Bible study material, free correspondence courses, as well as sermons and a host of other material. Please stop by and check it out.